The Blood Angels, one of the most revered and feared space marine legions, embody a paradox that few outsiders truly understand. At first glance, they appear as angelic warriors, noble defenders of the Imperium, whose legacy is marked by the grace and nobility of their Primarch, Sanguinius. Yet beneath this facade lies a darker truth, a legacy of violence, savagery, and a monstrous hunger that threatens to consume them from within. To grasp the full nature of the Blood Angels is to confront the unsettling reality that they are far more dangerous than their outward beauty suggests. From their origins as the Revenant Legion, the Blood Angels have been haunted by a brutal past. Their early history was marked by a savage efficiency in battle, a reputation that made even their allies wary. The arrival of Sanguinius may have brought them a measure of redemption, but it could not erase the darkness rooted in their very being. The genetic flaws they inherited, the Red Thirst and the Black Rage, are not mere aberrations, but the manifestation of the Legion's deepest, most primal urges. These curses, exacerbated by the tragic death of Sanguinius, push the Blood Angels to the brink of madness, driving them to acts of horrific violence even as they struggle to maintain their noble veneer. Despite their efforts to master these flaws, the Blood Angels remain a legion on the edge, their inner demons never fully tamed. Their pursuit of perfection, while admirable, is born out of necessity, a desperate attempt to stave off the horrors that lurk within. In truth, the Blood Angels are much worse than they appear, for their beauty masks a darkness that is always ready to burst forth. Yet, it is this very struggle, this ceaseless battle against their own nature, that defines them and makes their story one of the most compelling in the annals of the Imperium. Today we delve into the history of the Blood Angels. We will reveal all of their flaws and virtues, and perhaps reach an understanding of one of the most interesting legions. The Ninth Legion, known in whispered tones as the Revenant Legion, emerged from the shadowy recesses of humanity's past, forged in the crucible of the Unification Wars. Unlike the other legions, whose early exploits were celebrated in grand tales of conquest, the Ninth's history was shrouded in darkness and fear. Deployed to the most forsaken and irradiated zones of terror, they were less an army and more a force of nature, a storm that left devastation in its wake. Their ranks swelled with the broken and the damned, the twisted remnants of humanity who had survived in the most hostile environments. From this human detritus, the Revenant Legion arose, warriors of striking beauty who belied the monstrous origins from which they had been wrought. Their battlefield history was marked by a brutal efficiency that set them apart from their brother legions. While others sought glory in the grand theaters of war, the Ninth was sent to the darkest corners of the world, where victory was less a triumph and more a testament to sheer survival. They were the Emperor's blade in the shadows, cutting down enemies unseen and unheralded. Their campaigns were characterized by sudden, overwhelming assaults, often staged in the dim light of dawn or dusk, when their angelic visages, streaked with the blood of their foes, could sow terror in the hearts of the enemy. Yet, this fearsome reputation was not without its price. They were often seen as a necessary evil, a weapon to be used and then hidden away, their deeds acknowledged only in the hushed tones of those who feared what they could not understand. Despite their fearsome reputation, the Revenant Legion's success in battle was undeniable. They were masters of close quarters combat, excelling in brutal, short-lived engagements where their ferocity could be unleashed to its full extent. Their methods were unorthodox, often incorporating the bloody rituals that had become part of their battle doctrine. These rituals, 
which involved the consumption of the fallen enemy's flesh, served a dual purpose. They not only terrified their foes, but also allowed the Ninth to absorb their enemy's strength and knowledge, turning every battle into an opportunity for growth. This macabre practice, while effective, further alienated them from their peers, deepening the aura of dread that surrounded them. The Revenant Legion was a paradox, a contradiction in form and function that even the Emperor's most trusted advisors struggled to comprehend. They were beautiful and terrible in equal measure, a reflection of the Emperor's design taken to its extreme. Their genetic template, while gifting them with a grace and elegance that seemed out of place on the battlefield, also carried within it the seeds of a darker curse, one that would only fully manifest in the generations to come. This curse, hinted at in their eerie resilience and their unsettling rituals, was a shadow that hung over them, even in these early days. It was a forewarning of the inner struggle that would one day define them, a struggle that would only intensify after the death of their Primarch, Sanguinius. As the Unification Wars drew to a close, the Ninth was cast into the void, tasked with securing the outer reaches of the Sol system. Their mission to Neptune's moons was expected to be a death sentence, a final, desperate attempt to hold back the horrors lurking in the darkness. Yet, where others might have perished, the Revenant Legion thrived. They returned from Neptune not as broken survivors, but as a force reborn, their numbers replenished by the harsh, barely human inhabitants of those frozen worlds. It was here, in the silent, cold reaches of space, that they truly earned their moniker, rising again and again from the brink of destruction, like the undead warriors of ancient legend. In those bloody days, the Legion was an ever-changing beast, its ranks largely formed of line infantry equipped almost exclusively for the brutal madness of close quarters assault. This was a role at which the Revenant Legion excelled, always favoring a sudden and overwhelming charge to a long, drawn-out battle of attrition. They well understood the role of their macabre legend in war, most often choosing to stage their attacks at dusk or dawn and taking to the field unhelmed, that the sight of their angelic visages streaked with blood might unsettle the enemy. Even their silence on the battlefield became a weapon, an oppressive quiet that suffocated hope and spread fear. The Revenant Legion's silence was not just a tactic, it was a reflection of their isolation. Unlike other legions that basked in the glory of their conquests and the adulation of the Imperium's citizens, the Ninth was shunned, feared even by those they protected. They moved from battle to battle like wraiths, seldom acknowledged and rarely praised, their victories overshadowed by the unease they left in their wake. This detachment from the rest of the burgeoning Imperium only served to deepen their bond with one another forging a brotherhood that was as unbreakable as it was enigmatic. In those early days, before they became the Blood Angels, these revenants were harbingers of slaughter, a force of retribution sent to battle where no others could survive. Their enemies saw only the beautiful, blood-smeared angels who brought death with them, never realizing that beneath that angelic exterior lay the soul of a legion that had been shaped by an endless, destructive hunger. Their origins set the stage for the tragedies and triumphs that would follow, as their legacy was one of resilience, rebirth, and an endless battle against the darkness within their own souls. From the beginning, the Ninth Legion was known by a different name, a name that spoke of death of shadows, and of something more sinister than mere warriors. They were the Revenant Legion, a title bestowed upon them by Malkador the Sigilite himself, 
who recognized the spectral nature of these soldiers. Time and again, their pride was shattered on the battlefield, yet the same handful of names appeared in the annals of their history, creating an illusion of eternal champions. Some remembrances, eager to craft legends, wove these recurring names into epic stanzas, celebrating what they believed were indomitable heroes. But beneath the surface of these tales lay a truth far darker and more pragmatic. From their inception, the revenants were shaped by the direst of circumstances. The most extreme battlefields of the nascent Imperium were their crucible, and from necessity, they adopted practices that others would deem monstrous. Among these, a gruesome ritual took root, the consumption of fallen leaders by their subordinates. This cannibalistic act was not born of barbarism, but of survival, an efficient means to preserve the hard-won skills and knowledge of their captains. The victors would absorb the wisdom of the dead, ensuring that the Legion's strength did not wane with the loss of a single warrior. Over time, this practice became a tradition, with new recruits taking on the names of those they consumed, creating the eerie illusion of immortality within their ranks. This subtle form of continuity was so seamless that outsiders, even those familiar with the Revenants, rarely perceived the truth behind it. Ishidur Osuros stands as the most famous example of this tradition. Held as the Legion's first and only master before the coming of Sanguinius, his name persisted through countless records, each entry marking his death and subsequent rebirth. The truth, however, is that Ishidur Osuros was not a single individual, but a lineage of warriors who bore his name and carried his mantle from unity through the darkest reaches of the galaxy. This practice, though ensuring the Legion's survival, further isolated them from their peers. Other Legions, as well as the Imperial Army, viewed the Revenants with a mixture of awe and revulsion, their methods a necessary evil in the Emperor's relentless pursuit of conquest. The isolation of the Revenants deepened as the Great Crusade advanced. Without a guiding Primarch, they became increasingly insular, relying on their own brutal customs to survive the endless wars. The campaign on Kiburan, a world of irradiated sands and degenerate mutants, epitomized the harsh reality of the Ninth Legion's existence. Dispatched to relieve beleaguered Imperial Army regiments, the Revenants descended upon the planet with the fury of Storm Grey Angels. Their assault was swift and merciless, scattering the mutant hordes with ease. Yet this was merely the beginning of a protracted and bloody conflict that would test the Legion's mettle in ways they had never imagined. Kibaran was a world of madness, where the line between man and beast blurred, and survival hinged on the ability to adapt to the most horrific conditions. The Revenants, already accustomed to consuming the flesh of their fallen brethren, found themselves engaging in even more grotesque practices. The techno-barbarian warlord Eclobia commanded an army of countless mutant thralls, their twisted bodies imbued with a primal strength that threatened to overwhelm even the Astartes. As the Ninth Legion pushed deeper into enemy territory, they were met with an onslaught of unimaginable ferocity. The mutants, driven by Eclobia's sorcerous might, hurled themselves at the Legion in waves, their numbers seemingly endless. The Revenants, outnumbered and outmatched, were forced to retreat or face annihilation. Yet retreat was not a sign of defeat for the Revenants. It was a calculated move, a recognition of the limits of their strength and the necessity of survival. They regrouped, consolidating their forces and adapting their tactics to the brutal reality of Kiburan. The war dragged on for 12 long years, a savage conflict that saw the Legion reduced to a fraction of its former strength. But even in the face of such adversity, 
They endured, their numbers bolstered by the very mutants they had come to fight. Press ganged into service, these mutants were transformed by the Legion's Apothecarian into new recruits, their irradiated bodies made perfect by the gene seed of Sanguinius. The Revenants had become something more than mere soldiers. They were the embodiment of death, consuming their enemies not just in battle, but in body and soul. The final battle for Kiburan was a testament to the Revenants' unyielding spirit. Eklobia, weakened by years of attrition, attempted one last desperate gambit to crush the invaders. But the Ninth Legion had learned to survive in the harshest conditions, and they met his challenge with relentless fury. In a brutal campaign of attrition, they dismantled Eklobia's forces piece by piece, turning his own war-torn world against him. When the dust finally settled, it was not Eklobia who stood victorious, but the Revenants, their ranks once again swollen with the spoils of war. The cost of their victory was steep. When the Imperium finally arrived to reclaim Kiburan, led by Rogel Dawn and the Imperial Fists, they found not a compliant world ready to join the Emperor's vision, but a wasteland of death and despair. Dawn, shocked by the extent of the devastation, rebuked the surviving revenants for their methods, ordering the city of Buran to be razed and its memory erased. The sins of the Ninth Legion were buried, but the legend of the revenants grew. They were the specters that haunted the Great Crusade, the ghosts of war that struck fear into the hearts of even the most hardened warriors. As the Great Crusade continued, the Revenants drifted further into infamy. Their once proud ranks became a cauldron of blood rituals and dark practices, isolated from the Emperor's grand vision and shunned by their brother legions. Without a Primarch to guide them, they teetered on the edge of madness, their brutal efficiency becoming a double-edged sword. They were indispensable in the Emperor's wars, yet their methods made them a liability in the peace to come. The Revenants had become something more than a legion. They were a force of nature, a dark reflection of the Imperium's own savagery. Their fate was uncertain, and as they stood on the brink of destruction, a new chapter in their history began. The discovery of a world called Baal, its surface scarred by ancient wars and its moons echoing with legends of a bloody angel, would change the Ninth Legion forever. The Revenants, haunted by their past and uncertain of their future, would soon find a new purpose in the form of their long-lost Primarch, Sanguinius. The world of Baal, with its moons Baal Prime and Secundus, stands as a reminder of the potential for both greatness and devastation within the universe. Once a vibrant hub of humanity's ancient empire, Baal was a land of artisans and scholars, a place where the people lived in harmony with nature, creating wonders that reflected their civilization's zenith. But as the Age of Strife swept through the galaxy, Baal and its moons were not spared from the horrors that came with the collapse of mankind's dominion. The lush paradises of Baal Prime and Baal Secundus were transformed into irradiated wastelands, and the once proud civilization that thrived on these moons was reduced to scattered tribes, struggling to survive amid the ruins of their former grandeur. It was in this desolate environment that the Primarch Sanguinius, a being of otherworldly grace and strength, was cast down by the ruinous powers. His arrival on Baal Secundus marked a turning point for the tribes, known as the People of the Blood, or simply the Blood. However, Sanguinius's acceptance into the tribe was not immediate. The tribe's people, upon discovering the boy with angelic wings, were initially filled with fear and suspicion. They saw the wings as a sign of mutation, a common and dreaded affliction 
in their radiation-scarred world. Many among them wanted to kill the child, viewing him as a threat to their survival. But ultimately, compassion and curiosity prevailed, and Sanguinius was spared, though he had to prove his worth to the tribe in the harshest of conditions. Sanguinius endured countless trials in the wastelands of Baal Secundus, where even the strongest men would have perished. The young Primarch faced relentless dangers, from the deadly radiation that seared the land to the ferocious mutant creatures that roamed the desert. His survival in these extreme conditions was nothing short of miraculous. He fought and defeated these monstrosities, often with his bare hands, demonstrating not just his physical power, but also an indomitable will. As he grew, so too did his wings, becoming mighty pinions that carried him across the desolate landscape. These feats, combined with his growing wisdom and strength, eventually won him the acceptance of the tribe. He became a leader, guiding the people of the blood with a blend of ferocity in battle and compassion in peace. When Sanguinius eventually reunited with the Emperor, the transformation of the Ninth Legion began in earnest. Recognizing the darkness that lingered within the Ninth, both from their origins and the brutal nature of their existence, Sanguinius took deliberate steps to reshape their identity. He rechristened them the Blood Angels, a name that would carry both the memory of the trials they endured and the promise of redemption through nobility and discipline. This rebranding was not merely symbolic. It was a conscious effort by Sanguinius to temper the Legion's inherent savagery and guide them towards a path that balanced their ferocity with the virtues of honor and compassion. While this transformation was not entirely successful as echoes of their violent past still haunted them, the name Blood Angels became a beacon of hope, a testament to the power of change even in the most dire circumstances. Baal itself remained a world of contradictions, much like the blood angels who hailed from its scorched surface. The moons continued to bear the scars of their apocalyptic past, with the tribes of the blood struggling against both the harsh environment and the mutant horrors that plagued them. Yet, under the guidance of Sanguinius and later his blood angels, these remnants of humanity found a new purpose. The Arx Angelicum, the Blood Angels' mighty fortress monastery, was established on Baal, symbolizing the enduring strength and resilience of the Legion. It was from this fortress that the Blood Angels would recruit new warriors, selecting the best among the tribes to join their ranks, perpetuating the cycle of survival and excellence that had become synonymous with Baal. In the end, Baal is more than just a homeworld. It is a crucible, a place where the blood angels were forged in the fires of adversity. Sanguinius's connection to Baal was not just as a leader or a protector, but as a figure of hope and transformation. He saw in the desolate landscape a reflection of the potential for redemption, a chance to rise above the horrors of the past and carve out a future defined by honor and strength. This legacy, born on the windswept plains of Baal Secundus, continues to define the Blood Angels as they carry forward the ideals of their Primarch, always striving to be more than just warriors, but symbols of the enduring human spirit. With the reunion of the Blood Angels and their Primarch, during the Great Crusade, the Ninth Legion began a transformation that would etch their names into the annals of history. Their previous reputation as revenants was gradually overshadowed by the splendor and nobility of their Primarch, who sought to elevate his warriors beyond their grim past. Sanguinius led the Blood Angels across the galaxy, their golden armor glinting under alien suns as they fought to reclaim lost worlds for the burgeoning Imperium. The Ninth Legion, now fully embodying their new identity as the Blood Angels, 
became a symbol of hope, their presence on the battlefield often heralding victory for the forces of the Emperor. Yet, the Great Crusade was not merely a time of triumph. As the Blood Angels carved their legacy among the stars, they were also tested in ways that foreshadowed the darker days to come. The War Master Horus's descent into heresy marked the beginning of a cataclysm that would tear the galaxy apart. The Blood Angels, ever loyal to the Emperor and led by Sanguinius, found themselves at the heart of this conflict. The events leading up to the Horus heresy saw the them embroiled in battles that were as much tests of faith as of martial prowess. On the blood-soaked plains of Cygnus Prime, they faced the demonic legions of the Ruinous Powers, a harrowing trial that would leave scars not only on their bodies, but on their very souls. It was here that Sanguinius, in his wisdom and strength, held his legion together, their spirits unbroken despite the horrors they faced. As the Horus heresy reached its climax, the Blood Angels were called to terror to defend the Emperor's palace against the traitor forces. The Siege of Terror was a battle of unimaginable scale, with the fate of the galaxy hanging in the balance. Sanguinius stood in one of the last lines of defense. His leadership and valor were unmatched, and his presence inspired hope, even in the darkest hours. However, the final confrontation with Horus aboard the traitor's flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, was a moment that would forever change the Blood Angels. Sanguinius, knowing the cost, faced Horus alone. In this fateful duel, the noble Primarch was struck down, his death a sacrificial act that would echo through the millennia. The death of Sanguinius was a devastating blow to the Blood Angels. His loss was not just the death of a leader, but the shattering of a beacon that had guided them through the darkest times. The Blood Angels fought with renewed fury, their grief fueling a relentless drive to avenge their fallen lord. However, with his death, something profound changed within them. The legacy of his sacrifice, while inspiring, also left a deep wound in the collective soul of the Legion. Sanguinius's death during the Siege of Terror marked the end of an era for the Blood Angels, setting the stage for the struggles they would face in the centuries to come, as they sought to honor his memory while battling the darkness that now lurked within their own hearts. The Blood Angels emerged from the Horus heresy as heroes, their loyalty and bravery unmatched. Yet, the shadow of their Primarch's death loomed large, a constant reminder of the price they had paid. The events of the Great Crusade, the Horus Heresy, and the Siege of Terror had forged the Blood Angels into one of the most revered chapters in the Imperium. But the legacy of Sanguinius would also become their greatest burden. His death, while a symbol of ultimate sacrifice, was also the beginning of an internal battle that would shape the Blood Angels' destiny for millennia to come. The Blood Angels are a legion marked by both beauty and tragedy, a duality embodied in their genetic flaws, the red thirst and the black rage. These afflictions, deeply intertwined with the Blood Angels' storied past, represent the darker side of their nature, one that has haunted them from their origins as the Revenant Legion and has only intensified in the millennia since. The Red Thirst is perhaps the most pervasive of the Blood Angels' flaws, a hunger that gnaws at their very souls. This affliction manifests as an insatiable craving for blood, a primal urge that, if left unchecked, can drive a warrior into a berserk state of mind. The roots of the Red Thirst can be traced back to the Blood Angels' early history, particularly their time as the Revenant Legion. During those dark days, the Ninth Legion was known for its cannibalistic practices, a means of survival and dominance in the hellish environments they often found themselves in. This macabre ritual 
was not merely about consuming flesh, but was tied to their ability to absorb the knowledge and strength of their enemies, a practice that eventually became ingrained in their genetic makeup. The red thirst is the bitter fruit of this legacy, a curse that has followed the blood angels across the stars, threatening to consume them from within. The red thirst is not merely a physical affliction, but a psychological one as well. It is a constant struggle for the blood angels to maintain control over this dark impulse, to resist the lure of bloodshed that lies just beneath the surface of their noble exterior. The flaw is so ingrained in their psyche that even the most disciplined among them can feel its pull, especially in the heat of battle. For those who succumb, there is no return. They become little more than beasts, driven by the need to slake their unquenchable thirst. This internal battle is one that defines the Blood Angels, a perpetual reminder of the price they pay for their extraordinary power. The Black Rage, on the other hand, is a more recent development, though its roots can be found deep within the Blood Angels' history. It is a genetic curse that forces its victims to relive the death of Sanguinius, experiencing his final moments as he faced Horus during the Siege of Terra. The Black Rage drives its sufferers into a frenzied state, making them believe they are Sanguinius himself, caught in his last desperate battle against the War Master. This affliction is a direct consequence of the Primarch's death, exacerbated by the trauma that rippled through the Legion at that fateful moment. However, even before this tragic event, there were hints of this flaw within the Blood Angel's ranks, a latent darkness that only needed a catalyst to fully manifest. The Black Rage is more than just a psychological affliction. It is a spiritual scourge that tears at the very identity of the Blood Angels. Those who fall to the Black Rage are lost, their minds shattered by the overwhelming power of the Primarch's death. They are formed into the Death Company, a unit of warriors doomed to die in battle, their only solace the hope of redemption through a glorious death. The existence of the Black Rage serves as a grim reminder of the Blood Angel's tragic legacy, a burden that weighs heavily on the chapter as they continue to fight for the Emperor's cause. Together, the Red Thirst and the Black Rage encapsulate the dichotomy of the Blood Angels, warriors of unmatched grace and nobility, yet forever haunted by the darkness within. These flaws, though they threaten to destroy the chapter, also define them. The Blood Angels' eternal struggle against these inner demons is a testament to their resilience, a symbol of their determination to rise above the curses that have been placed upon them. As they continue to wage war across the galaxy, the Blood Angels carry with them the weight of their genetic flaws, ever striving to honor the memory of Sanguinius while battling the shadows that lurk within their own hearts. Sanguinius, the angelic primarch of the Blood Angels, was a figure of unparalleled grace and nobility. Among his brothers, he was uniquely beloved, not just for his prowess in battle, but for the profound empathy and warmth he exuded. Even those Primarchs who were stern or distant found it difficult to harbor ill feelings towards Sanguinius, whose radiant presence seemed to bring light into the darkest of places. His bond with his legion was even stronger, for they saw in him not only their leader, but also a guiding star, a symbol of everything they could aspire to be, despite their cursed nature. Sanguinius understood the burden his sons bore, the genetic flaws that gnawed at their souls, and sought to inspire them to rise above it, to fight the battle within as fiercely as they fought the enemies of the Emperor. To temper the violent tendencies of the Blood Angels, Sanguinius instilled in them a deep appreciation for the arts, encouraging them to seek solace 
and expression in creative pursuits. This was not merely a diversion, but a deliberate effort to channel their inner turmoil into something beautiful and constructive. The Blood Angels became renowned for their artistic achievements, their works reflecting the duality of their existence, sublime beauty intertwined with underlying darkness. Through painting, sculpture, and music, they sought to express the conflicts within their souls, and in doing so, they found a measure of peace. Sanguinius believed that through these pursuits, his sons could anchor themselves, preventing the red thirst and the black rage from consuming them entirely. This cultural focus on self-improvement and artistic expression set the Blood Angels apart from the Emperor's children, who were also known for their obsession with perfection. However, while the Emperor's children pursued perfection for its own sake, often leading to vanity and excess, the Blood Angels' quest for self-improvement was born out of necessity and a deeper, more meaningful struggle. Their battle for perfection was not just about aesthetics or martial prowess, but about mastering the inner demons that threatened to undo them. This made the Blood Angels' journey one of redemption and constant vigilance, rather than mere vanity. Their artistry was a reflection of their eternal struggle, a means to channel their darker impulses into something constructive rather than destructive. Despite the heavy burden they bear, the Blood Angels continue to strive toward the ideals Sanguinius set for them. Their battle against the Red Thirst and the Black Rage is ongoing, but it is a fight they do not undertake lightly. Each Blood Angel knows that their efforts are not in vain. Every act of creation, every stroke of the brush, every note of a song is a defiance against the darkness within. In their quest for self-improvement, they find purpose, and in their art, they find a form of salvation. While the scars of their genetic flaws will always mark them, they refuse to let these define them. Instead, they choose to rise above, to embody the ideals of their beloved Primarch, and to continue the fight against the shadows that seek to claim their souls. In this, they find hope and perhaps redemption. The Blood Angels stand as a testament to the complexities and contradictions within the Space Marine Legions. Their legacy is one of both beauty and horror, a constant struggle to balance their noble ideals with the darker urges that threaten to consume them. Despite the monstrous potential that lies within, the Blood Angels continue to fight for the Imperium, not just against external foes, but against the demons within their own souls. This eternal battle defines them, making their story one of tragic heroism and relentless perseverance. In the end, the Blood Angels are more than just warriors. They are a symbol of the unending struggle between light and darkness, perfection and madness. Their tale is a reminder that even the most revered heroes are not without flaws, and it is through their efforts to overcome these flaws that they find their true strength. If you enjoyed this deep dive into the complex nature of the Blood Angels, don't forget to like this video, subscribe for more Warhammer 40k content, and hit the notification bell to stay updated with our latest explorations into the grimdark universe. Your support helps us continue to bring you the content you love.